a podcast about amazing people from an incredible state. Amazing Arizonans with Mike Broomhead. All right, another episode of Amazing Arizonans and a conversation I've been trying to put together for a long time, but a busy guy. So do we say, all right, so first is Chance Cosby. Thanks for doing this. Of course. Is it uh, Thunderbirds? Is it Three Pieces of Pecan? Where do we go? Where do we start? Where, how, what do you want to be introduced as? Uh, how about Chance Cosby? Okay. Executive director of the Thunderbirds. Perfect. Host of the WM Phoenix Open. Yep. Which is what we do. And uh, and then on the side, I like to cook. And uh, so people call me Three Pieces of Pecan. They call me Three Pieces. They call me Pecan. D- did you uh, expect that? No. No. I mean, I, uh, I've always cooked. So I uh, was very fortunate. I grew up in a great home in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And my mom was a great cook. Uh, and my dad was a golf pro at the country club there in, in uh, town. And so... Uh, I had a hot breakfast every single morning and was making omelets when I was eight years old. And and then my dad, the club was closed on Mondays. And so he would usually do some barbecue on Monday. And so my dad only cooked outside, you know, on the grill or on the smoker. And then my mom did all the cooking inside. And I just kind of grew up around golf and food and family, which is a pretty good way to grow up. So um, it's how you came up with the handle on instagram right yeah so during covid uh my youngest son he said hey you're cooking dinner every night you know everybody was home and restaurants were closed or you know it was an interesting time in all of our lives and we were just cooking a lot and he said i should just start filming and i see that canes hat on your on your head there so (laughs) we were watching the uh oklahoma florida bowl game on new year's eve and during the game and we were beating florida and he just said, "Hey, we should, we should start filming you cook." And I go, "What? What's that mean?" And uh, he downloaded TikTok on my phone that night, and said, "We need a handle. Like, what do you want the account to be called?" And uh, my dad had passed away in August of the of that year, and he always cooked with three pieces of pecan on his smoker. That's how he like regulated the fire. And I just, like, within, like, five, six seconds, I just said, three pieces of pecan. So he started the account, three pieces of pecan. And and uh, we, you know, talk about not knowing what you're doing. Yep. Like, no expectations, right. no vision, no nothing. Like, let's just film some stuff and see what we're doing. So my 14-year-old son, uh, he just started, like, filming, putting things to music. Turned into an influencer. And, he, and somehow, here we are, you know, a few years later. Well, I... Um, we've known each other casually for a long time, for media, sure. the tournament. And I was last January, I was in New York. My nephew plays high school basketball and he was playing some feature games. So holidays, I flew mm-hmm. to be with my brother um, and my sister-in-law. We were watching my brother play high school basketball. Mm-hmm. And my brother says to me, there's this dude from Arizona mm-hmm. that cooks. He goes, his food is amazing. I cook his recipes all the time. And I said, who? It was you. Three pieces. Said, I know him. He goes, get out of here. And I sent you a text or a message. And it was just so funny, the reach. I don't know if you are, I'm sure you're aware of it, but I don't know if you ever expected it. Did you expect to have the reach with that platform? Because I watch him. My brother said to me, I was just with him. Make sure it was his... Was it sheet pan lasagna? Sheet pan lasagna, yeah. He said, you just cooked your sheet pan lasagna. <laughs> it's one of his favorite recipes. It's so great. Isn't I, that cool? I will say the fun part about it is that we, I think that we knew that it was like going to do something. And again, another great idea from my son. We did like four or five videos. It, you know, None of them got any views, like you know, 500 views, 600 views, something like that. And uh, the upcoming night, he said, hey, I think you need to go on camera and do something simple. People need to see your face because we were putting stuff to music and like yeah. literally don't know what we're doing. Not that we do now, but we, uh, so I got on that night and we were making like chicken and broccoli. And I just, and I remember saying tonight, we're going to make broccoli, even your kids will eat. And then we just made some roasted broccoli. That's it. And, um, and then the next morning we woke up and it had like 15,000 views and I'm like, wow, 15,000 people have watched this. And then maybe a week later, we did a salsa video and we were going to a backyard barbecue because people were doing backyard barbecues right. during COVID. And um, so we whip out this salsa video and 
um, we and then we we went to the barbecue, but we posted it. He posted it on the way to this barbecue, and then like two or three hours in, he came over and he goes, "Hey, have you looked at that salsa?" I go, "No, I haven't even got my phone out." He's like, "We're at a million views," and I'm like, "Oh," and he was like, "We got something," and so now we've just like. Um, you know, we've just continued to like, okay, let's do two or three videos a week. I've slowed down, I would say, in the last six months just because work is busy and life is busy. And, um, you know, I try to at least do one video a week. Um, the beauty of it now is I have like 530 videos canned. Yeah. And, you know, when I'm super busy, I can take a video from two years ago and post it. I did a bolognese uh, post this last weekend, mm -hmm. I filmed it two years ago. Yeah. So all I had to do is go, go on my phone, post it. It took a minute, and it's got like 1.3 million views. But what you do is so good because a you make it look doable. Mm -hmm. You know, you people want to try it. You're not creating. You're like I watch. I love Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. And you watch Gordon Ramsay cook, and you think first he's of a all, pro. And well, not just is he a pro, but he's using ingredients. That like I've never even heard of that. Never mind. Do I have it just sitting on my kitchen counter? Yeah. But then I love the fact you know you've got the catchphrase when you eat it. Yeah. It's damn good. That it's kind just, of happened. But it's but yeah. it, it all of that has got to be a part of the brand, and I just think it's great for you. I think it's the coolest thing, man. My brother brings it up out of the blue a year ago, yeah. and he again when I just talked to him. Make sure you tell them sheet pan lasagna. I that, it. That's a really good one. I I would uh, I'd be lying if I told you that like I. I didn't enjoy social media because I do. Uh, when I was at Ping Golf, um, I started the Twitter account for Ping Golf. Oh, you did? Okay. Because of my, you know, I've always just been into social media. That's how I consume my news and um, and I enjoy it. And now, like, you know, it has been fun. It's been fun for my family. It's been fun for my son. Um, it has turned into something that we never could have expected. I had a buddy text me last weekend. And he said, hey, I'm down at Rocky Point. I just saw a guy on the beach wearing a three pieces of pecan T-shirt. That's so cool. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. That's you know, cool. you know, who knows? You know, who knows where everybody always asks me, like, like, what's your end game or where's all this going? And I just say uh, that I don't have an end game. I don't know where it's going. Um, I'm just trying to like, you're right. I've I'm trying to cater to the people that follow. Sure. And that means I can't just smoke a brisket every weekend on a smoker. And, and for that, that's not engaging. No. I, that's like my favorite meal, but a lot of people don't have a smoker and, and they don't, that's not going to resonate of like me smoking a 17 pound brisket. So you'll see like a lot of my posts are everyday meals that like busy working families or working adults or, or kids can make. As long as you have a kitchen, you got a skillet, you've got some heat. And, um, you know, I'm not worried about like healthy food. Like I cook with butter and cheese and cream and yeah. I want to, you know, that's what we eat. And, um, and I just try to make easy recipes and then I deliver it on purpose in a very easy way. Like I, I go on the first three or five seconds and kind of say what I'm cooking. The next 50 seconds is all, it's all food. Yeah. No, not, not me. I don't need to be on camera and it's just step 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 in like one to three five second clips yep and then at the end i take a bite and say damn good and yep. wrap it up <laughs> and the best part of, well the best part of that is watching those step by steps it's ingredients people have so when i watch those videos i'm thinking all right i got this i can get that yeah and it makes me want to you know, i posted some videos or not videos pictures mm -hmm. on my instagram of just cooking because i love to cook mm -hmm. nowhere near the level of you but i love to cook i live alone um, so I cook stuff. I'm gonna eat it for three days. Yeah, so I post things uh, chili um, Which is really funny because my first one was my chili that I made and then I posted and then everybody said what it post the ingredients yeah. So I didn't post the making of it. I posted the ingredients. That's good Then I watched your video and I thought oh my gosh, there's three steps I missed that I'm gonna try next time yeah. but the biggest response I get on my social media are pictures of the stuff I've cooked with the recipe with that I kind of doctored from somebody else. It's amazing how people engage with food that way mm -hmm. on social media. And it isn't, I'm sure, like again, the the Emeralds and all those guys have their huge social media platforms, but the people that are cooking in their homes that are really good at it, what's the other guy's name? Um, 
Cooking with Daryl? No. Um, uh, there's the, a there's a bunch of them. I, I, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, oh, the guy the guy in Louisiana. What we cook today with the oh. one big white beard. You know who I'm talking oh, about? Oh, I'm not sure I've seen it. Oh, I'll have to check it out. He's. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a minute. But he um, he's hilarious. Yeah. And uh, um, but he cooks on everything's in cast iron he cooks over fire okay and everything looks delicious cornbread it's all southern really yeah. it's just great stuff and he's down in louisiana so i love it I'll yeah check that but out. those are the guys and he's like you he's got a brand that he's yeah. organically created and people just love it because it's organic it's not some contrived yeah it didn't idea there wasn't any it was all organic it's all pretty innocent and even like when i started doing it I, um i'd have a couple friends they in you know, the first couple months they're like Hey, are you on TikTok? I'm like, yeah. I started a TikTok account. Yeah. They're like, do you have like twenty thousand followers? I'm like, yeah. It's kind of growing. And then what's uh, it up to now? I only do one video, and I'll post it on TikTok. I'll post it on Instagram. Post it on Facebook, and post it on YouTube. Um, and I'm at a just over one point five million followers. It's amazing. And um, and and even the damn good happened by accident. We were in a hurry. We were making smoked queso. And we needed to be somewhere. And so my son's filming. He's like, we, we, Dad, we've got to go. He's like, get this inside, take a bite. And, and this is one take. There's no redos. And so I... Oh, you've I, got a director. Oh, yeah. He bosses me around. It's <laughs> awesome. And I, you know, I put the smoke queso that's been out there on the smoker for a couple hours. I put it on the stove, grab a chip, take a bite. And I just looked at the camera. I'm like, Phew, that's that's damn good. And he's like, okay, we're good. And we're going, he goes, hey, by the way, you need to keep saying that. Yeah. And then I just started saying damn good. Well, out of like, a, you know, why not? Let's the guy, just say it. The handle of the other guy is cooking with Cajun. Okay, I'll cooking check it out. Cooking with Cajun. I'll check that out. But I can't, re we can't really repeat what he says mm -hmm. because his hook is every meal, you got to have cornbread. Oh. But it's the. Yeah, yeah. Cornbread. Yeah. It's hilarious. But yeah. it's it's everybody waits for the hook at the end of the video. It's just one of those things. Yeah. There's a lot to think about in there. Like I, I do try to keep the page uh very family friendly, you know, rarely like I don't like promote or rarely have a drink in my hand. Yeah. Even, every now and then I'll have like a glass of wine but or I, I might you have cook a, with beer or cook with but yeah. you cook the alcohol out anyway. You cook the, if you're but I I try not to like I just you know, of course I say damn good. Some people don't love that. Um, but other than that, like it's it's like no nonsense. <laughs> this is how you cook it. And I'm not like putting on like some crazy show. It's just start to finish. I don't know finish. anybody that could have TikTok or Instagram or Facebook could be concerned about damn good with some think, of the stuff. I think it's pretty safe. <laughs> I think it's really safe. I, I sleep okay at night. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure not, I'm, not, I'm not too worried about it. I want to talk about the Thunderbirds because my connection with the Thunderbirds happened um i had been here for years and years and years and never been to the tournament mm -hmm. never been the w w and phoenix open and um tim woods mm -hmm. became a good friend and at the time he was i think he was the security chair or something and i went out and loved the tournament but what i got to see was all of you guys in the tunics and he started telling me the history and i love arizona and i love the of history of arizona yeah and so to hear the work that you do and everybody I've ever talked to, whether it's professional athletes or whoever they are, you guys are all type A, big time leaders in your community and your businesses. Mm -hmm. Every person I've ever talked to sincerely has looked at me and said, writing the checks is the best part about what we get to do. No question. Um, you know, not being from here, I will tell you that, um, you know, I moved here from uh, Oklahoma in 1999. I finished school there. Um, at OU, and I moved out to work at Ping Golf, uh, which is a great family company based in based in Phoenix. Similar values, oh, as for far sure. as giving in the community and the benevolence of that family. The Solheim family is incredible. Incredible. And then I, you know, I knew I'd go to the Phoenix Open, and I, you know, I saw these, you know, this group in Tunix. Uh, I didn't know who they were. I just didn't know much. Of, didn't know much about it. And then uh, I got asked to be in the group in 2010, and um, and really had no idea what I was getting into or what it was. I just knew, I learned that they hosted the Phoenix Open and obviously a nonprofit. And um, so I joined the group and, and I, you know, my first role um, was tickets and banking, uh, which means you, you kind of live at the front entrance 
around will call and ticketing and and uh, make sure everything's going smooth at our entrance. And um, to think now, you know, 14, 15 years later, you know, I'm working for the organization and I work for a nonprofit. And and of course we do, as you said, you know, we host, you know, an incredible tournament in the WM Phoenix Open, but our best days are when we're giving out checks. You know, the tournament's only one week a year. It's a year's worth of work. I was going to say. It's a year's worth of work. <laughs> You're the uh, first plus... Thunderbird I've ever said, <laughs> heard say that it's only one week a year. Well, the tournament's one, one week, week a year, year. but it's... Um, it is a full-time job and more. Don't you start um, building in October? Yeah, we started, well, we actually started a, a month ago. So we started in mid-September, um, kind of first shovel in the ground. And um, if you go out there now, like 16 and the Cove are well on their way. Kiva Club's already built. They do a lot of work during overseed on the inside mm -hmm. of the golf course right. so they don't disrupt play <laughs> when the course opens back up. Um, but... You know, you go out there now, and it's starting to look like the WM Phoenix Open. And a little history about the organization. For the people that don't know, the Thunderbird started its young businessmen. Uh, it, so there is the, you're, they're chasing, they're looking, I shouldn't say chase, they look for the younger business people that grow in the organization. Correct. And you kind of grow your way out, and you become a lifer, and it's always got that fresh blood coming in. And that's, that's a cool element of what you do. I think it what it's what kind of makes it work. So the organization started in 1937 by the uh, Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, and the vision was to put together a group that would promote the Valley of the Sun through sports. And so they grabbed five business leaders at the at the at the time, and said, "Each of you five, go get ten of your friends, and we're going to start a nonprofit, and we're going to promote the Valley of the Sun through sport." You can imagine what the valley looked like in 1937, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and you know it was probably a big desert. And so Bob Goldwater thought it would be a good idea to host a golf tournament. I don't believe, as the story's told, like nobody really thought that was a good idea, um, but he thought it was a good idea, and he did it. And he was our tournament chairman for, I think, 18 or 19 years in a row. And that's why we call him the father of the Phoenix Open. He really got this off the, off the, off the ground. It was at Arizona Country Club and Phoenix Country Club. And then we moved out to TPC in the, uh, I think, 86, 87. And, you know, the PGA Tour built TPC Scottsdale for the Phoenix Open. And um, and you look at those first year of pictures. There was nothing out there. Yeah. And um, and to see what it's become now, um, you're right. Um, you know, you get in the group kind of your mid 30s. Uh, when you turn 45, you become a life member. The difference between active and life is if you're active, you have a job at the open. Um, that job could be anything. It could be parking. If you're the parking chairman. You really don't even go on the golf course the whole week. You're in all of our parking lots. You're working with the city of Scottsdale and Scottsdale PD, and you're making sure that our parking operation's going well. Anybody that's not been there, the rideshare lot yeah. is insane. That's crazy, yeah. The buses in and out. It is, it is, it, it, the only thing I can compare it to, to anybody that's not been out, is that trip to Disney, figuring out how you're going to get into the park and mm -hmm. move all of those people. It's it's amazing what you pull off. It's uh it's something. I mean, I I would I I agree. It's become a bucket list event for so many people, and and that experience like starts with, hey, if your parking situation is not great or you don't have a good experience in parking, and the shuttle buses aren't running on a regular basis, then your your image of the Phoenix Open is already not great before you've even got on the golf course. Right. So, um, everybody has a job. Concessions is a job. Child care for the PGA Tour is a job, um, and then you know the, maybe the more glamorous jobs are you're the chairman of the 16th hole, or you're the chairman of Greenskeeper or Bay Club or one of the venues on the golf course. Um, but everybody has a role that they have to do, and we just say, hey, stay focused on your role, and and do it great, do it better than the person that was there the year before, and make improvements. And then once you turn 45, you can stay involved or not stay involved. It's completely up to you. We have a ton of lifebirds that make an incredible impact on the tournament and the organization well past the age of 45. But you've got um, you know, professional athletes, business 
Barron's, you know, Barron's a business. Former Governor mm -hmm. Ducey is a is a Thunderbird. Um, I know that you made a former Vice President Dan Quayle an honorary Thunderbird. His yeah. son is a Thunderbird. Yes. Um, so you've got people where it's people are honored to be asked to be a part. Did you ever imagine that part of it locally, but internationally? When you go play golf at Royal St. George, you go play somewhere around the world, mm -hmm. and they recognize – the, the thunder yeah, yeah the what's logo. that like uh you know i mean we take great pride in that you know we take great pride in like what the phoenix open has become um as an event um but we you we take more pride in that our charity numbers now over 208 million dollars and our economic impact is almost a half a billion wow. it's 450 million dollars a year the wm phoenix open brings to the valley an economic Im impact and that's every year. That's not just one year. Right. And so, you know, we 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 run a great PGA Tour event, and we're proud of that. But, you know, we're helping the community, and we're helping organizations in need, and we're filling up restaurants, and we're filling up hotels, and, and, we're, and we're promoting the Valley of the Sun through sports, which is what we were founded to do in 1937. When you um, – one of the things that is very touching to me – is the work the Thunderbirds do with Special Olympics. Mm -hmm. What an incredible... Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, you know, we get to go out and um, and give out medals and give high fives and hugs when they come through the finish line or whatever the competition is. Um, probably my favorite Special Olympic sport is weight weightlifting or powerlifting. They're strong. They're into it. They have so much fun. And then to be there when they they hit their PR or their their personal record, um, and give them a high five. You know, just the energy is is incredible. And then we get to put a uh, you know a gold medal around their neck or a silver or a bronze or or just something to you know make them understand that they're important and what they've accomplished is is incredible. And we're there to tell them a good tell them good good job and keep on working hard i had a friend who was the um <clears throat> was the uh, teacher at um marcos Deniza high school and mm -hmm. the best buddies program and i would go and uh, just hang out with the class and uh the first time i went it was shortly after the special olympics and they all brought their medals to show me they were wearing their medals and they brought right. them they were so proud of uh you know they just it it was so the 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 genuine happiness and joy and knowing that you guys make such an impact and that the guys i know in the thunderbirds will be as excited about the special olympics as they are of being on 16 or in any other place that it is it's impact it's not for sure. It's not the party. It's not the celebrity. It's the impact. Uh, th I mean, that's what we are. That's our mission. I mean, our our goal is to raise as much money as we can from the WM Phoenix Open, move that money over to Thunderbird Charities, and then let our board distribute that money. And then we get the honor, you know, throughout the year to, uh, to do some site visits and deliver some checks and, um, and, and make really fun decisions, especially... Even during the summer, you know, when we get an, you know, we get an emergency reach out from a nonprofit or human services campus that says we're in desperate need of water and sunglasses. Yeah, okay, you need water and sunglasses. You know, those are basic needs that people should have, and we can, you know, we can do a quick give. We can work with one of our partners and say, hey, we need to order a thousand pair of sunglasses, and we need X amount of water. And then we'll get it to them within a couple of days. And that's like, you know, they don't need water in two weeks. They need water yesterday. Yeah. And and um, and so those are also fun things that that you can make an impact on quickly. And we did that during covid, too. We did a million dollar emergency fund during covid. And I remember um, donating our organization, donating mattresses to an organization because they were trying to put people in beds but yeah. they didn't have anywhere to sleep you know it's it's cool to be a, a part of that i never i've been in the golf business my my whole life and and now being on the nonprofit side while i'd say 85 percent of my time is focused on the tournament and managing the tournament making the tournament better with our team um you know probably 15 percent is just organization thunderbird charities the thunderbirds and 
and being a you know a strong non nonprofit here in town. And w- the magic, at least from an, an observer's point of view, maybe I'm wrong, is watching a bunch of people that are leaders in every aspect of their life, that they're the ones that are kind of making the decision makers mm-hmm. to get them to work together and pull in the same direction would sound like an impossible task of egos. Not in a bad way, but the egos. Sure. But. Every time I've been, and I've been invited behind the scenes a little bit because of people like you that have let me see what you guys do. It is like a big family and nobody cares about any credit individually. They just want it to be the best. I just, I was shocked by the lack of ego Mm -hmm. around the rooms. Yeah, I mean, you've got to check your ego at the front door. Like nobody cares, you know, uh, what kind of business you run. Nobody cares how big your house is or what kind of car you drive. Like we're... We're just we we've got to run a golf tournament, and um, if you're on concessions, then you need to do great at concessions. And you might be the CEO or a business owner, and moving around ice on a Saturday might not be what you want to do, or it's not a very glamorous job. But um, you know that is really the the magic of the growth of the Phoenix Open is the organization is all in, and um, and you have a lot of people that are giving their time. There's no money involved. Right. And um, and so, you know, without the thought of personal gain is, okay, I, whatever my job is at the Phoenix Open, I'm gonna go do it. And I'm gonna go do it great because we've gotta run a good golf tournament. And then if I do that well, we're gonna raise more money. That's more money to Thunderbird Charities and, and then you can make a difference. Is there a little ego in each individual running it better than the guy that did it before and the year before? I would say it's competitiveness. No, that's okay. That's <laughs> I would it. say it's competitiveness is that, you know, we don't, um, you don't see many people that say, hey, it worked fine last year. I'll just rinse and repeat. Right. Um, there's not a lot of rinse, rinse and repeat at our tournament. Otherwise, the tournament would get stuck. And I think another thing that's important is that we have a new tournament chairman every single year. And the tournament chairman, when you bring a tournament chairman from a different walk of life, let's just think... Tim Woods. Yeah. You know, he owns his own insurance business, but he's a Blackhawk pilot. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Tim Woods. Yeah. He's going to see the tournament much differently than Chance Cosby as a golf guy. Yeah. And, um, and, and it might be a variety of industries. We've had tournament chairmen that are in real estate, in banking, surgeons, et cetera. We all see car dealers. Car dealers. We all see the, the property in a completely different lens and say, I, I kind of want to make this change and make this improvement. I'm like, wow, I never would have thought of that. Yeah. And um, I think that's just nice that you got a fresh set of eyes every single year. When you look at what uh, the bird's nest, which has become an event or events all mm-hmm. to them, it's not, it's separate. Yeah. But it's amazing. And now the decision to have a concert on 16 and how do, you know what, it's just, <laughs> yeah. it, you, it's so for some, again, an observer, you walk out there on Saturday, and I had the privilege of being on 16, and then when you've expanded the boxes on 17, being out there, and you look around at the mass of people, and everybody's having a good time, and it's just something that you can't think, how could you possibly improve this? And then all of a sudden, you, the next year, it's the, the lineup for the bird's nest is bigger than the year before. Yeah. We've got something special for everybody. You started adding um, years ago kind of EDM and some things mm-hmm. to bring in a younger crowd. I mean, it's it, it's incredible what you, how you just keep making it fresh every year. Yeah, the concert in the Coliseum, I would tell you, like from my perspective, I thought it was a... I thought it was a big risk. I was just, you know, being a golf guy, I'm pretty conservative. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this. Like, you know, we're going to have a concert on the 16th hole on Saturday night. I'm thinking we have a pro-am on Monday. Like the course has to look perfect on Monday morning for our Monday pro-am. And um, we had a couple guys in our group, uh, Michael Golding and Scott Jenkins. They, they came together and like, we've got this vision for this concert in the Coliseum. And I'm like... Man, I just think don't I think things are going fine. Like, why do we need to throw another event in there? But I will tell you, um, it has become a special event. The goal of that night, when the idea was formed by them, was let's try to raise a million dollars for charity in one night for the proceeds from the concert in the Coliseum, and um, 
thanks to the city, thanks to TPC Scottsdale allowing us to do it. You know, we come in and we our team builds this stage right in the middle of the hole, and by noon on Sunday, it's like it never happened. Yeah. Like right when the act is over on Saturday night, the whole production team comes in, they take everything apart, they move it to the bird's nest because it's the same stage. Yeah. And then, you know, by Sunday afternoon, the whole looks perfect. There was never a concert there. And that, that kind of blows my mind. That's a lot of great people working together to uh, on a common goal. And uh, in and, and, and three years in, um, we are right on the verge of raising a million dollars in one night. We almost did it last year. I, th- I think we'll do it this year. There is, uh, you got to have him buy in from the players at the tournament, but you also have to have buy in from the performers at the Bird's Nest. Do they buy in to what you guys are doing? Do they know ahead of time this is who we are and this is what we do? They they do now. Um, they understand like the purpose of the event, the the how special it is. Bird's Nest is, you know, we'd love for the Bird's Nest ideally to be a little bit bigger, you know, because there is some restrictions on all the math that goes in of what you can pay an artist and and we want to keep ticket prices reasonable. But I think that the industry now knows that the Bird's Nest is a real venue and the concert in the Coliseum is a real venue and it's a first class op- operation and that's enabled us, you know, to get bigger and better yeah. acts. Uh, I, you know, whether we get a deal or a discount to be candid, I really don't know, but I know that they, they know that we're a nonprofit and they know that our money is going to a good place. And, and, um, and, and I'm proud of what that our whole music team has built. You know, I'm pretty focused on the golf tournament, um, but we have a whole nother separate, you know, unit of our group that is focused on, yeah. the, on the music side, um, because you got to put on a four night music festival and um you know my but when you say that it's i mean give me some names that i don't say toby keith kid rock the Mm. band perry um tiesto to go back to the to the edm stuff Uh, these are these are people i've seen so uh, i'm trying to think of some of the others florida georgia line okay was one of the biggest like when we got florida georgia line at the time like they were not that they're not big now but at the time we're like whoa they at get, their peak, they they they're like wow. They got Florida Georgia Line for the for, for the Bird's Nest and Super Bowl year. Uh, we got Kid Kid Rock oh. and Toby Keith, and it was just like that was just incredible. Yeah. You know, Kid Rock. I was sitting there when he came on stage, and I'm like, I've never seen somebody enter the stage like Kid Kid Rock. It's it's really been great. And so recently, we've moved towards. Uh, a couple nights of country uh-huh. and then we'll do you know some kind of rock or you know some kind of theme like last year we did duran duran and it was which so was cool which was cool and For then, an 80s kid that was then, cool and then you throw an edm like we've done kygo several times tiesto kygo is a fan favorite you know he's just everybody loves kygo right. and, and that's a great time on saturday night and this year We've got Jelly Roll on Thursday. I wasn't going to say Luke, anything. No, I no. Just, we, we, excuse, sorry. Jelly Roll on Wednesday. Yeah. Luke Bryan on Thursday at the Bird's Nest. I know. And and a lot of people are thinking, those are guys that, those are acts that could play at the concert in the Coliseum. Yeah. And um, and so we're, we'll, uh, we'll be announcing concert in the Coliseum here soon. The reason why I mentioned the Bird's Nest is because if that's what you did as an organization... It would be what everybody talks about. It would be mm. one of those events. You know, it's like Country Thunder. Sure. You know, it's one of those things that's an annual event that everybody looks forward to. You couple that with the undertaking of the WM Phoenix Open, and it is it is a pretty good-sized city for a week. Yes. When you – everybody has to talk about 16 because of what it's become. I remember um, one year uh, during the Pro-Am – um, I was asked, uh, I think it was the year that Tim was the chairman. They did a first responder appreciation after the pro-am. On Wednesday. On, uh, yeah, yeah, on, on shot Wednesday. At, yeah. Shot at glory. Yeah, shot at glory. Mm-hmm. And they asked me to MC that event. I helped them get some of the people involved. Okay. And I remember uh, watching uh, Mark Wahlberg play through. Um, we watched Jerry Rice. Yeah. And then when it was done, they had the flyover by the helicopters. But to see Jerry Rice finish his round, finish 17 and 18, and then come back yeah. for the ceremony, and he shook 
every cop and every firefighter's hand and took every picture anybody asked him to take. That's the buy-in from the people that are involved. There's a difference between, sure, I'll show up to your golf tournament. Sure. And this is really cool. Kudos to them. Like, they, they give us their day. You know, when we bring in ce- celebrities for our, our pro-am, you know, ideally they go to the pairing party on Tuesday night, uh, which is a bit of a lift. You know, it's more of their time and their time is valuable. And then they, they play in the pro-am. And then we ask them right when the pro-am's over to go to 16. Because we want to see Michael Phelps on the tee. And yeah. he, he bends over and his arms are going everywhere. And everybody loves that. And I remember Jerry Rice. Um, and I remember how gracious he was. Uh, with everyone, um, and I think Mark Wahlberg might have hit a ball out of the stadium. Yeah, uh, I think he asked for a redo. Can yeah. I can I get a mulligan? Um, but Mark Wahlberg, that's a great example. Is like he's like it's a it was a bucket list event. He just wanted to come play TPC Scottsdale during the Phoenix Open, and I wanted to get inside the 16th hole and feel it and see it and and then you feel those nerves. You know, we've had a Rod play several times. Emmett it's Smith funny to played. see those guys who have been in those super legitimately championship moments in their sport. Sure. Knees knocking on 16. Fortunately, I've got to play in the Pro-Am uh, the year after your tournament chairman. I was tournament chairman in 19. I got to play in 20. And uh, I hit the green. Um, I wasn't crazy nervous on the shot. I mean, it was a nine iron. I'm like, I'll just tee it up a little bit higher. Maybe give me a little bit of wiggle room if I if I don't make good contact. But then I felt it more on the green. Like I get over my putt, and I remember we're playing with Harris English, and and I got over the putt, and like my hands were shaking. And Harris is standing. He goes, he started laughing. He goes, "How are your hands doing there, bud?" Yeah. And I'm like, I can't get my hands to stop. And then I just hit the putt, you and know, because I'm you like, are, I'm ready to get out of here. You're. A, I mean, what's your handicap? I'm a one. So you, yeah, I'm a decent you, golfer. Yeah, yeah, you're a great golfer, and there you are with because the fans look like they're right on top of you. They, yeah, they are, and they love to cheer and they love to boo, which yeah. I like. I think it's that's great. great about that hole. So one other thing about 16, and I want to move on. Okay, the video, and I can't remember her name, of the young girl that was a high school golfer that played 16. Amy Bockerstadt. Yes. Yeah, it was her birthday this yeah. this was week. It? She okay. sent me a text a couple days ago. Um. Watch her tee it up, Mm -hmm. hits it in the bunker, Mm -hmm. hits it out of the bunker, and makes the putt for par. It's amazing. That crowd lost their minds for her. Yeah. But the look on her face, but everybody playing with her, kind of tearing up. It was a moment. It was a moment. It's one of the greatest moments in the history of our event. It if, really is. If we're being honest. I swear. It like, really it, is. It all came together. You know, we didn't know if she was going to be comfortable hitting the shot. Um, she came out through Special Olympics. And, um, you know, she agreed to do it, which was amazing. And then she hits it in the bunker. And I think Gary Woodland was like, hey, do you want to pull it out of the bunker and maybe just put it yeah. on the green? And she said, I, I got this. Yeah. She's like, I got this. But her wave I got to this. the crowd. And she hits it out, and then she makes the putt, and then she waves, and then she started a foundation called I Got This. Oh, and, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, she has a foundation called I, I Got This, and um, in a couple weeks, I'm actually speaking at their annual foundation event and have become very good friends with Amy. Um, she texts me all the, all, all, the, all the time. I'll send her a video on her birthday, and she's so sweet. Um and if people want to see what that tournament does and what the Thunderbirds, how it encapsulates who you are and what all that is, that video, people have got to go search it out. It's easy watch, to find. Yeah. Watch it. I promise you, you're going to get you're going to get teary eyed. Mm-hmm. It's emotional in such a positive way. It is. It really is an incredible video. It's it's I mean, she's been on the t- Today Show. Her and Gary Woodland are incredible friends now. And um, that is just one of the moments at the WM Phoenix Open that, you know, you can't create that. You can't script it. Something like that has to happen organically. And it did. And and then, you know, it just kind of shows what one little opportunity for one person, what impact it can have on so many. Because she's she's an inspiration now. And now she's got a foundation. Yeah. She's doing her own great, great work. And helping other people. And helping other people. One thing I want to I want to make sure we talk about, um, in addition to some of these other things, is the tee-off luncheon. Mm-hmm. 
Did you ever imagine, um, in just the time you've been with them, mm-hmm. that you would have Condoleezza Rice, uh, former President George W. Bush, yeah. Michael Phelps, and by the way, um, Derek Hall does an amazing job with he's those so guests. He's so great. He's so great on the mic. He is hilarious when he's supposed to be. Yeah. He's serious. He asks really good questions. When he was on the stage with Phelps, it was magic with those two. It was hilarious. Yeah. But to to see Condoleezza Rice, you know, and and George W. Bush, these are world leaders. Did you ever imagine that you would be able to land those people to be the keynote at your no, I think that that lunch has grown uh, to a level that we're that we're we're obviously very proud of. I mean, to have uh, Condoleezza Rice was that was a big get. I was there. That was a big get, and that was Tim Woods, and um, and he was very passionate. That um, he's like, hey, because I, I was the year before, and I'm kind of a sports junkie. And I got Kirk Herbstreit, which was another one and, that was amazing. And and his so, story, and he didn't even know, like when he, he, you know, he knew what he was coming to. But when he walked in the room, he was like, "How many people are here?" And I'm like, "Oh, fourteen, fifteen hundred." He's like, "I had no idea it was this big." And he did a great job. And and um, and then you go to Condi, and then you go to George W. Bush, and George just was was incredible. You know, he had that he had that humor. That w- that we've all you know that we all love, but he, with Derek Hall, just being able to manage that and get yeah. him, you know, get the right questions and then let everybody's there to hear him speak. Derek and uh, uh, Derek, he does credits, a wonderful job. Derek credits W with his weight loss. Is that right? Yeah, <laughs> he talked about that day and one of the they were interacting on something. I think it was about him mountain biking. He's very pa- uh, uh, We did learn quickly, like he's very passionate about his health. Yeah, and uh, was very vocal, and I I, I laughed. Uh, the WM executive had uh, spoke right before George W. Bush came on stage, and he was wearing like green pants, green shirt, and a and a plaid green sport sport coat. And um, when Bush got on stage, he's like, "Man, that 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 guy from WM, he goes, he looks like a piece of broccoli." Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "That's how he kind of kicked yeah. off the thirty or forty minutes that he spent on that that he sent on stage with us." And and now, you know, we're, we've got Nick Saban coming this year. Yeah, I was going to ask. There's a lot of excitement about Nick Saban. How I mean, could there not be? I mean, he's the, you know, arguably the greatest football coach of all time. Um, he's on college game day, and he does an amazing job on college game day of, like, letting us all get a little glimpse of what made him successful as a coach. And, you know, I, we can't wait to let – Derek Hall just lobbed the right questions But you've done that with all of them, because yeah. that's the key to that with, with Herb Street. I'm a big fan uh, of his. I love what he does for college football. I had no idea about the story of his boys and, and the things that were going on and the, the, you know, the contract with making sure he gets to his boys' games and sure. all that stuff. Uh, Michael Phelps and the hard work and the things he had been through, how many calories he eats a day, and how funny Derek interacting with him was. But even with Condoleezza Rice and asking her some questions to get her to loosen up a little bit, yeah. Bush was – I've done a couple of events with the former president uh, when he was president. Mm-hmm. And behind the scenes, he's a really funny guy. And it was cool that you guys were able to bring that – he felt comfortable enough to just be that. Sure. You know? That's yeah, kind of cool. It's cool. You know, I think that um, – you know, I think just like music and just like our tournament and the tee-off luncheon that – I think our track record is is strong that um, that, you know, we you know, we're going to we're going to bring you here. It's going to be a first class event and it's going to be run the right the right way. And we're not going to abuse anything. If we say, hey, we're going to have we're going to have you on stage for 40 minutes and you've got to do a 15 minute meet and greet. And then we're going to get you back to the airport and you're going to get home. Then we, you know, th- we have a minute by minute schedule for the tee off luncheon. And we don't go off script. And I think that you have it's to respectful. do that. It's it's respectful. This is what we agreed to, and we're you know we're we're great we're grateful that you're here. And um and if we ever need you to come back or we ever need a favor to maybe make a connection with somebody else, if they don't have a good experience, well then we're not going to get a vote of confidence there. So we just we want everybody to, we want all of our guests to have a great time, but we also want our speaker to have a good time. Yeah. And feel like you know what that was. That's what I signed up for. There was no surprises, and uh, I'd do it again. So, last question is uh, this this year. 
What can mm-hmm. people expect? I think that you're going to see um, a new Phoenix Open in many ways. You know, we're um, we we've just kind of started to give the public a glimpse of the things that we've been working on um, since the tournament ended in 24. And uh, probably the main things, we're closing down Hayden Road. Uh, for those that don't know, Hayden Road runs parallel to the 18th hole. Uh, that has historically been a very busy road. Oh, yeah. And, um, and we are closing down Hayden Road uh, for any kind of public traffic, and we're putting in a new entrance um, on 18. Um, that'll be a temporary build on Hayden Road and give us another really good entry exit point into the golf course. We have a lot of foot traffic that comes from the south, and they would previously have to walk all the way up Hayden Road, take a ride on Bell, go through the mags, and go around. So um, it's going to be a great entry, but more importantly, it's going to be a great exit. Is that, you know, towards the end of the day, especially on our big days on Friday and Saturday, is that, you know, when you're leaving 16, 17, and you're walking on that hall road, making your way to the to the bridge behind number eight, 18, you're going to be able to exit on this new exit. You're going to be on Hayden Road. There's not going to be cars, and you're going to be able to go to wherever your destination is with much more ease. And then we have, the Thunderbirds have invested this summer heavily into the infrastructure at TPC. Uh, we've widened cart paths, we've widened widened walkways, and then we've made a big investment out on number 12 and number five. Those are general admission venues that um, we're doing a ton of earthwork, and all of it is just like, we've just think fan experience, player experience, how do we make it better? This is gonna be money well spent for the future of the event. And then we've definitely done some changes with our ticketing. Um, we got rid of good any day tickets. Uh, all of our general admission tickets are gonna be digital. Um, we don't have any third parties that we're partnering with in the, in, the mar- in the marketplace that you can go get a discounted paper ticket. We've just kind of ended all those programs. And, and so digital tickets on our website really gives us complete control of how many people are there every single day. Good any day tickets, you know, that ended up on a bad weather week. That ended up being a challenge because we had a lot of those good any day tickets fulfilled on Saturday. And um, and so, you know, we are just Matt. Matt Mooney is our tournament chairman yeah. from day one. Um, you know, with the challenges, we just said his motto has been better, not bigger. Yeah. And uh, you're going to hear us say that a lot. Um, you know, if if it would have been 72 and sunny at the 2024 Phoenix Open, we would have had a normal event, a great event, and we probably wouldn't have been in a position or needed to feel like we needed to make some of these changes. But, but it still but, was a great event. It was a it was a great event. We had a challenging Saturday, yeah. you know, and and we've said that. And the weather was atrocious all week. And um, but because of that, you know, it's it's put us in a position to really do a deep dive on. Okay, where can we where can we make this event better? Where can we make it better for our fans and better for our players, better for our sponsors? And that's what we're committed to doing. And I think when you come out, whether it rains or it, or it's seventy two and sunny, like it should be in February in Phoenix, um, you know, it's going to be a great event. You're going to have a great experience, and we we hope everybody comes out. I think every tournament focuses on making sure you're bringing in the best players in the world or in the game. You want to make sure the player experience is one that they want to come back. Your focus on that, obviously, but also the fan experience. I've watched how you guys work and focus on making sure if a fan needs something, they get what they need in spite of the fact that it's this massive crowd. But your focus on the fan experience is incredible. The success of the WM Phoenix Open is because of this community. You know, we 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 don't build everything out there without without the demand that the community has brought to this event. So, the community, in step with the Thunderbirds, uh, and our title sponsor WM, have all worked together to build what is currently there. And we wouldn't build the 16th hole or Bay Club and all these venues around the course if there wasn't demand. And then. From a general admission standpoint, we wouldn't build out all these beautiful general admission fan experiences if the crowd didn't come. And so, you know, everybody's done their part to make this event a successful event. And um, we're just excited. We've we've done eight or nine months of work now. Um, we, we live and breathe this golf tournament every single day. And, um, and we have a great team doing it. 
And we have a team that works on the fan experience. We have a team that works on the player experience. They're both equally important. We are a PGA Tour event. And now all of our venues sell out before anybody even knows a field is released or a player has committed. We're not as reliant um, on that field, but our fans also expect the field to be good. Right. They're like, hey, it's the it's the Phoenix Open. I'm going to see Scotty Scheffler coming down the stretch against yeah. Xander Shoffley. They just expect that, and um, and so uh, we've got to continue to produce a good product so the players will come back. It is cool on 16 when people are knowing who's coming through. Oh yeah. And for people that haven't been, there's a tunnel the players walk through to get to the tee, and so. It, it there's kind of a murmur in the crowd mm-hmm. and when those superstar players break through that walk through that tunnel it's a moment it is pretty cool it's a moment it is incredible and then when you see someone hit a great shot and what's interesting is to watch the differences in some of the players some of the younger players maybe um i love when they get on the green at 16 um and they get over their putt and they're looking at everybody like and they're getting the crowd yeah. going instead of trying to get the crowd to be quiet. That's it's almost just, easier when the crowd noise is when you know it's going to be yeah. Up, yeah. But but the fact that they they get the the vibe, you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's the fan experience. I mean, I was I said last question, but it's that fan experience that you've got people lined up at dark in the morning and sprinting to sixteen to get in there. Yeah. It's it's an incredible um, event that you guys have put on, and and I. It, this is just such a great honor to talk to you because, uh, as you can tell, I love this tournament and the guy. So do I. Because of, well, be, <laughs> and because of Tim, I've gotten to know some of the Thunderbirds, and I just respect so much the hard work you do. And people, I people need to know every day kind of how hard you work and the money you raise for this community because you do such great work in Arizona. Well, thank you. I uh, I think on behalf of the group, we just appreciate the opportunity to um, to to come on the on the pod here and and talk about something that we love. You know, we we love the tournament. We love giving back. We love the community, and the community supports us so much. And um, you know, it, it's really our honor. I mean, yeah. we it we we pinch ourselves when we go out there, and um, you know, you build it. They come. Everybody has a good time. And um, and it's all built around a PGA Tour event that this community and the Thunderbirds have built. And, um, you know, we, we, we love talking about it. We, we grind on it every single day. So personally, it's nice to just sit here and talk about it for a yeah. moment because uh, we, we don't get many opportunities to do that. So we just appreciate the support and the, the platform to do it. And, and we're going we're gonna to keep working hard to make it as good as we can. There are classically Arizona events. We host Super Bowls. We've had national championships. We have the Fiesta Bowl. We have Pat's Run, which is uniquely ours. But there's nothing like the WM Phoenix Open. That is Arizona's event, and it's a world-renowned event, and it's awesome. And thank you again. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, Chance Cosby from the, WM, from the Thunderbirds and the WM Phoenix Open. Thanks for watching Catch Up on Amazing Arizonans, a KTAR News podcast. And click the button in the middle to subscribe.